Welcome to EPG Partshala lecture series in computer science. This course is on operating systems. Today uh, in this class we will learn about deadlocks. So, the learning objectives for this class is to understand what is meant by a deadlock in a system and to find out or to learn the different methods for different handling deadlocks and to know what a resource allocation graph is and how a resource allocation graph can be used for handling deadlocks. So, what is meant by a deadlock? We have learned about uh, systems where there are a number of processes and there can be a number of resources uh, in the system. So, when you have a certain system like that, processes will request for resources for their execution. And there can be many processes that are running simultaneously, they can be concurrent processes that are running and all these processes will need resources. So, if resources are not available, then process will have to wait. And if the resources are held by other waiting processes, then the process will continue to wait forever. That is, say you have a process that is that needs some resource, say the printer. And there is another process which is currently holding the printer and it is uh, waiting for some other resource which is held by the first process. Then both of the processes will be waiting for each other and hence they continue to wait indefinitely. And this kind of a situation is called deadlock where you have a set of processes and in which all the processes are waiting for some other process in the same set and is holding some resource which is needed by another process. And look at this example, you have a bridge crossing example where you have a bridge uh, which can be passed through only by one vehicle at a particular time. And traffic say can happen in only one direction and each section of a bridge can be viewed as a resource. So, now if uh, vehicles come from the left side and vehicle comes from the right side, both of them they try to cross and they come to the middle of the bridge, they find that they cannot proceed further. That is because uh, the bridge can be used at a time by only pro vehicles that are coming from moving in one particular direction. Vehicles moving in both the direction cannot use the bridge. So, now this results in a deadlock. So, two vehicles they come, they come to the middle of the bridge and they cannot proceed and results in a deadlock, they cannot proceed further. So, now if this deadlock situation has to be handled, then it can be resolved if one of the car backs up and if there are uh, several cars and you may have to be backed up if a deadlock occurs. Say for example, say both the sides you have vehicles which are clogged and just the vehicles in the middle of the bridge backing up may not solve the situation. Even the uh, vehicles which are waiting here behind also may have to be backed up if all may, if too many vehicles are being uh, clogged here. So, it is also possible to have starvation because it will take a long time for the vehicles to use the bridge because too many vehicles are being waiting. So, this kind of a situation can happen even in a system. So, you have a set of blocked processes and each process is holding a resource and is waiting to acquire a resource which is held by another process in the set. So, look at this example, you have a system which is two tape drives and there are two processes say P1 and P2 and say P1 is holding one tape drive and P2 is holding the other tape drive. There are totally two tape drives, one being held by P1 and the other being held by P2 and each of these processes P1 needs both of the tape drives to finish off its work and P2 also needs both of the tape drives to finish off the work. So, now what happens P1 and P2 each one be having uh, one of the tape drives, they are waiting for the tape drive which is being held by the other process. P1 is waiting for the tape drive held by P2 and P2 is waiting for the tape drive held by P1. So, now what happens that results in a deadlock situation. Now, look at another example, say you have 
two semaphores A and B and is initialized to 1. That is the initial value of the semaphores is 1 and there are two processes P0 and P1. What is meant by this initial value of semaphores? Uh, if the initial value of a semaphore is 1, then if it is guarding a resource, that resource can be used by only one process at a time or it is a resource which is not shareable which can be used by only one process. If the initial value is 1, it can be used by only one process. And now A and B are semaphores initialized to 1. And now look at this two processes P0 and P1 are trying to execute the sequence weight of A, weight of B and P1 is trying to execute weight of B and weight of A. Suppose the first statement is executed by P0, P0 executes weight of A. So what does P0 do? P0 decrements the value of A and it becomes 0 and P1 executes weight of B. So initially the value of B is 1. So P1 uh, decrements the value of B because weight of B will decrement the value of B and becomes 0. Now the next statement to be executed by P0 is weight of B. The value of B, semaphore B is 0 already. So weight on B, weight of B will make P0 to wait. It cannot continue. And what happens to process P1? P1 also executes weight of A. The value of A is currently 0. So P1 also continues to wait. P1 cannot continue further. So now we can see here that this P0 is waiting for semaphore B to be signaled and P1 is waiting for semaphore A to be signaled and both are being done by the waiting of A was done by P0 and waiting of B was done by P1 and both the processes are waiting on each other and they continue to wait uh, further or they continue to wait indefinitely. So this is another uh, example of deadlock situation that can happen in a system. Now if you look at the system model, we are looking at uh, a system which has got resources and we are assuming that there are only a finite number of resources and these resources are distributed among the processes that are competing to acquire those resources. And there are a number of resource types, say R1, R2, etc. up to Rm are the resource types present in the system. Suppose say for example, you can have resource types can be CPU cycles, you can take memory space as another resource type, you can look at IO device as another resource type, etc. and so on. Or say for example, you can look at say a printer as a resource type and in each resource type, there are many number of instances. Say look at printer as a resource type, you can have many instances of the printer. You can even have say 5 instances or 4 instances and so on. So you have one category of a resource or a resource type and within that category or within that type you can have a number of instances. And when you look at processes, the processes can be many, you can have many cooperating processes and these cooperating processes they will be utilizing resources. They have a sequence or a model based on which they utilize the resources. Uh, say for example, they utilize resources in a sequence like they first request for the resources and then they use the resources and then they release the resources. Say when they request for the resources, the processes may immediately be assigned with the resources or they may have to wait for the resources. And once they get the resources, they will use the resources and after using the processes will release the resources and other uh, processes can use the resources. And for uh, supporting this, you can have system calls also. And the number of resources requested by any process, it should not exceed the total number of resources available in the system. Say for example, you have got say uh, 4 printers only in the system and then if a process is requesting print, uh, 5 printers, it is not feasible. So, the number of resources requested should not exceed the number of resources available in the system. And for requesting and releasing, there are a number of system calls available. There is support with system calls. 
Say for example, you have got a system calls for requesting and releasing device, for opening and closing file, for freeing the memory and so on. And requesting and releasing of resources can also be accomplished through wait and signal operations on semaphores. Say you have some resource and which needs can needs to be shared by many processes, then any process who needs to use the resource will wait on a semaphore and after using the resource they will signal the semaphore. And this semaphore is the one which will maintain the synchronization between the multiple processes that are trying to access that particular resource. And in the system, there is a system table. The system table will record whether each resource is free or allocated. And if a resource is allocated to which process. And using this system table, allocation of resources and releasing of resources can happen. So, whenever a process needs a resource, when it is requesting for a resource, then the system will look into the system table to find out whether that resource is free or not. If it is free, then the request can be satisfied. And similarly, when uh, the uh, resource is allocated to that particular process, then it makes an entry as to which process the resource has been allocated. And if a process requests a resource which is currently allocated to another process, then you have a queue of processes that are waiting for that particular resource. And this process is also added to that queue of process. So, when that resource is being freed by the process which is currently using it, then one of these processes that are waiting in the queue will be given the re resource next. Now, look at this uh, deadlock characterization, uh, we have deadlocks happening in a system and what are the conditions uh, based on which deadlock can occur in a system. There are four conditions and all these four conditions need to hold simultaneously and only then deadlock can arise in a system. So, what are the conditions? One is mutual exclusion and in this only one process can use a resource at a particular time that is called mutual exclusion. We have learnt about mutual exclusion uh, when we learnt about process synchronization. So, if a process, if only one process can use the resource at a particular time, then that situation is called mutual exclusion. And then you have hold and wait. In this, a process which is holding at least one resource is waiting to get other resources and the other resources which this is waiting to get is currently being held by other processes which are in turn waiting. And the next situation is condition is no preemption. A resource can be released only voluntarily by the process which is holding it. Nobody can forcibly remove the resource from the process. Only if the process wants to release the resource, it can release the resource or relinquish the resource by itself and no one else can force it. So, this is another condition. And then you have the fourth condition that is circular weight. In circular weight, you have a set of processes say P0, P1, etc. up to Pn and then P0. So, that is you have a set of processes which are dependent on each other in a circular fashion. That is P0 is waiting for a resource that is held by P1, P1 is waiting for a resource held by P2, etc. P2 is etc. And then you have process Pn. And then Pn is waiting for a resource that is held by process P0. So, you have processes that are dependent on each other in a circular fashion. So, if such a kind of situation happens in a system, then there is a possibility for deadlock to happen in a system. So, there are four, all these four conditions that is mutual exclusion, hold and wait, no preemption and circular wait should be present in a system and only then deadlock will happen in a system. Say if one of these is not there, then deadlock cannot happen in a system. And in a system, you can depict or you can show how uh, deadlocks uh, are happening or you can even show how a system uh, is present using something called a resource allocation graph. This is similar to any other graph that you have. This also has got a set of vertices and this also has got a set of edges. So, what do the vertices are defined? There are two categories of vertices. One is 
the set of processes. The processes are also shown as vertices and say p equal to p1 etc up to pn are uh, the set of all the processes present in the system. And then you have the next set of vertices that is the set of all resources say r equal to r1, r2 etc up to rm. This is the set consisting of all the resource types in the system. This is not the uh, individual resources exactly. If you have uh, different resource types, each one correspond to a different type of resource. And looking at the edges, you have a request edge. There is a direct edge from say pi to rj. And then you have something called an assignment edge. This assignment edge is a directed edge from Rj to Pi. So, if there is an edge from P1 to Rj, then it means that this process P1 is requesting for an instance of resource Rj. And if there is an edge from Rj to Pi, then it means that this resource Rj is being assigned to Pi. So, looking at the uh, resource allocation graph, you have different symbols or the way in which you represent a resource allocation graph, we can see now. You have a process represented using a circle and then if it is a resource type, then it is represented using a uh, rectangle and within the rectangle, you can see small boxes, uh, those are uh, the different instances of this particular resource type. So, here it is uh, shown that this particular resource type has got 4 instances. And say if process PI is requesting for an instance of RJ, then you have this request edge that is directed from process PI to RJ. And say if you want to show that process PI is holding an instance of Rj, then that can be shown like this. You have this uh, resource and resource type, this Rj is one particular resource type, say for example printer and then you have 4 instances of the resource type, that is you got 4 instances of the printer and of these one of the instances is been assigned to process PI. So, this is an assignment edge, this is the way in which assignment edges are shown in resource allocation graphs. So, this is an example of a resource allocation graph. So, here you can see that, that there are 3 processes P1, P2 and P3 and there are 4 types of resources R1, R2, R3 and R4. R1 there is only 1 instance of R1 and there are 2 instances of R2, 1 instance of R3 and 3 instances of R4. And there is a request edge from process P1 to R1 which shows that P1 is requesting for an instance of R1. But now currently there is only one instance of R1 and that instance is assigned to process P2. So, there is an assignment edge from R1 to P2. And P2 is requesting for one instance of R3, but the only instance of R3 available is assigned to process P3. And process uh, P1 is being assigned one instance of R2 and P2 is assigned one instance of R2. There are two instances of R2, one is assigned to P1 and the other is assigned to P2. And there are three instances of R4 and none of these is currently assigned to any process. In a resource allocation graph, uh, if there are uh, cycles, then if there are no cycles, then it means that there is no process deadlocked. So, from the resource allocation graph, we can find out if a system is deadlocked or not. So, if you have a system uh, where you have processes and resources, all those can be represented using a resource allocation graph. And from the resource allocation graph, you can try and find out whether the system is deadlocked or not, just by looking at the cycles. So, if the resource allocation graph contains cycles, then deadlock may exist. If only one instance of each resource type is available and if there is a cycle in the system and offshore there is a deadlock. And if there are multiple instances of a particular resource type, then there may not be a deadlock. Now, look at this example. Here there is a cycle 
from say P1, R1, P2 and R2 and again back to P1. So, there is a cycle here and there is another cycle say P2, R3, P3, R2 and then again back to P2, this is another cycle. So, there are two cycles in the system and uh, here uh, it is a deadlock because say P1 is waiting for a resource held by R uh, uh, by P2, P2 is waiting for a resource held by P3, P3 is waiting for a resource held by P2 as well as by P2, P1 and here you see that all the processes are dependent on each other. So, you have only 3 processes P1, P2 and P3 and all the 3 processes are waiting for some resource which is held by some other process. So, you can see that there is a deadlock in the situation. So, there is cycles and in this graph and you also have a deadlock, but it is always not necessary that if you have a cycle, you will have deadlock in a system. It is also possible that even with a cycle, there may not be a deadlock in a system. Now, look at this example, you have a resource allocation graph with a cycle, but there is no deadlock. How is this possible? So, how what is this graph, what is this depict? There is process P1, uh, P1 is uh, waiting for or uh, requesting for an instance of R1 and there are two instances of R1, uh, both of the instances are being currently assigned, one is assigned to process P2 and the other is assigned to process P3 and you have two instances of R2 and one is assigned to process P1 and the other is assigned to process P4 and P3 is requesting for an instance of this R2. So, here there is a cycle, is there a cycle? There is a cycle. So, you have a cycle from P1, R1, P3, R2 and then P1, but the situation does not show or does not depict a deadlock. So, what is it? How do you say that it does not have a deadlock? That is because say you have this uh, process P2. This process P2 is holding this R1 resource, but it is not waiting for any other resource. It is not a blocked process, it is not a waiting process, it does not need any other resource to complete its execution. So, when this process P2 finishes off its execution, it will release R1 and this R1, this instance of R1 will become free in due course of time. Very similarly is the case with this process P4 also. So, process P4 is also holding one instance of R2, but this P4 is not waiting for any other resource and it is, it can continue its execution, it can finish off its execution. So, P4 in due course of time will release this instance of R2. And hence, we will have one instance of R2 that will become free of shear and another instance of R1 which will also become free of shear. So, certainly these two instances will become free and hence this instance can be assigned to process P3 which is waiting for R2 and this instance can be assigned to process P1 which is waiting for R1 and hence this deadlock will be uh, broken or the cycle will be broken and there is no deadlock. So, here we see that uh, even uh, if there is a cycle there may or may not be deadlock, but if the instances of the resources is only one that is if you have only one instance of a resource then certainly we will have deadlock in a situation of sure we will have deadlock in a situation. So, the facts here that we have learnt is that, so if a graph contains no cycles, then there is no deadlock. So, that we can surely say that when there is no cycle, there is no deadlock. But if a graph contains a cycle, then there may or may not be a deadlock, but if there is only one instance of each resource type, how many ever be the types of resources you have, if you have only one instance of each resource type then if there is a cycle then you have deadlock and if there are several instances of each resource type, there are multiple instances of each resource type then there is a possibility of deadlock, you may or may not have deadlock. 
So, how do uh, we handle these deadlocks? Uh, one is that we can ensure that the system will never enter a deadlock state. So, we need to have methods for preventing deadlocks. And the other is, the other method is you try to let the system enter into a deadlock state but then you try to make the system recover from the deadlock state. And the third way in which you handle deadlocks is that you ignore the problem and pretend that deadlocks never occur in the system. So, this is the way that has been used by most of the operating systems including Unix. Now, how do you uh, ensure each of these? How do you handle each of these? The first thing is that we need to ensure that deadlocks never occur in a system. And for this, you have methods for deadlock prevention and methods for deadlock avoidance. And for deadlock prevention, what you do is that uh, you need to have methods that will ensure that at least one of the necessary conditions uh, does not hold good. That is, we saw four conditions that are necessary for deadlock to happen in a system. One is mutual exclusion, next is hold and wait, then you have no preemption, then circular wait. Then if you are able to ensure that one of these four conditions do not happen in a system, then we can prevent deadlocks. And deadlock avoidance, how do we avoid deadlocks? So, in a, for avoiding deadlocks, you need to have additional information about which resources a process will request and use in its lifetime. So, once you have this additional information, then you can collect all this information and keep. So, initially even before the system starts, each process should say uh, how many instances of each resource it will request for its entire lifetime. And then based on that, whenever a request comes from a process, you can need to ensure, you need to ensure if you can give that request to that process based on the previous or the prior knowledge that you have. And if deadlocks occur in a system, if you are letting deadlocks to occur in a system, then you need to have deadlock detection and recovery mechanism. And if there is no deadlock detection and recovery mechanism, if the worst case you are not preventing deadlocks, you are not trying to avoid, you are not trying to find out even, then deadlocks will occur and the system will go very slow. And if the performance of the system deteriorates, then the system should be restarted manually. So, these are the different methods of handling deadlocks. So, the summary of what you have learned today is uh, deadlocks will occur or may occur in a system which has got shared resources and system can be depicted using a resource allocation graph and using the resource allocation graph you can try to find out whether there is deadlock or not. So, a cycle in a resource allocation graph may or may not indicate a deadlock in a system. The references, acknowledgement, thank you.